Okay, tonight we're going to continue. We're in a study of First Samuel. Tonight we're going to be in chapter 18. But since we have a lot of new people with us tonight, I'll just recap. Why do we study something out of the Old Testament? It's, it's historical. It, it's not really giving us prescriptive things of how to live our lives. Uh, really three reasons. Three reasons we're in this book. Number one, if you want to know about Jesus, you want to know who he is and understand his ministry and his life, you have to know who David was. And Jesus refers to himself as the son of Abraham, the son of David. And so if you don't know why that's relevant, then you got to learn about David. And to learn about David, you got to study the book of 1 Samuel, at least to start. Uh, David is the most mentioned person in the Bible. It's incredible. So we, we, uh, we're studying that to learn about Jesus uh, in a tangential way by learning about David. Number two, it is God's word. It's profitable. We have that guarantee. So being in it, because God has authored it, and he's intended us to read it, uh, we're going we're gonna to benefit uh, because of that. And, uh, and number three, because uh, the word of God often gets abused. And so we have to make sure that we have a good understanding of it. Tonight's passage uh, gives us answers to all three of those areas, and especially, and we're going to see right away, um, abuse of Scripture. And so we're going to talk about how this passage gets abused in our in our world and just kind of make some points on that. We're not going to beat a dead horse, but we're going to deal with it because it's important. Uh, but this chapter, again, is, is looking at uh, Saul's fear of the rising David. Saul is on the decline. God has rejected Saul, and Saul knows it. Uh, David has already been anointed by the prophet Samuel, and he is going to be the next king, but he's not yet. He's not yet. And so this is a real turning point, and we have a critical verse in here that's going to explain everything between David and Saul. And so we'll get to that here shortly. But first, there is this introduction talking about Jonathan's love. Remember, Jonathan, we saw him a few chapters back. Jonathan is the son of King Saul, and he became a friend of David. We'll pick up in uh, chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. After David had finished talking with Saul... Jonathan became one in spirit with David, loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Just pay attention to the language. See if you recognize it, okay? Maybe that again. Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. So we have this incredible uh, start in this uh, exchange of this royal garment. And uh, most people read this, they look at, you, you got to realize this is not just some guy saying, you like my jacket? Here, up. Why don't you have it? It's so much more. Who is Jonathan? He's the son of the king. He's the heir apparent. But there's a problem. The king has been rejected by God, and God has already chosen a replacement. Now, we, when we got to this point where Saul was being rejected by God, and Solomon, I mean, excuse me, Samuel told Saul, you're rejected. You know, we know that Saul knows that. But Saul just kept on being king. Didn't change a thing that he was doing. Now, we don't know how much David knew when he was anointed. The text doesn't tell us if Samuel explained to David, hey, I'm anointing you because you're going to be the next king. It doesn't say that. He says he anointed him. Now, as we get to this chapter, this is a chapter that has some specific scenes in it, but also has this uh, kind of summary feel, like, like the, the author is describing in a broad sense you know, the major themes that were developing. So when I come to this chapter, I'm going to be honest with you. When I read this chapter, I have a growing sense that everybody is in the know of what's going on. By that, I mean Saul knows about David. And I think you're going to agree with me as we get to that because Saul's feelings toward David begin to change in this chapter. Jonathan's feelings are important because if Jonathan believes his father is the king, then he is the heir apparent. He'll follow his, in his father's footsteps. But by his action here, we've already seen something. Let me back up. Let's go back to this. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, 
along with his tunic and even his sword and his bow and his belt. There's so much in that verse that it's easy to miss. First of all, we have to understand the culture. In the Eastern culture, talking about the near ancient Near East, and, and this is true still in some of those countries today, for a royal to give a garment, their own personal garment to a person is an incredibly high honor. You know, if you're over there and you're visiting with a Saudi prince and he takes his jacket off and gives it to you, okay, you're in, right? <laughs> Start cashing in that oil money right away because you're, you're somebody special. That's the culture, and it was that day. Now, a lot of people look at this, and I'm one of them. Now, we can't know this for sure because the text doesn't say for sure, but it, there is that implication that this was, this, by this act, Jonathan is abdicating any claim to the throne because he's taking off the royal garment because it mentions the robe and the tunic. Pretty much all you got on, okay? He took off the robe, he took off the tunic. And those are royal robes, and he puts it on David. So I have this growing sense that Jonathan was aware. God has anointed David. Now remember, Jonathan and David are of one mind and one heart. They're both courageous. The last time we saw Jonathan, what, four chapters ago, he didn't think twice about going into the Philistine camp, charging in, trusting God. And it was about trusting God. And God gave the Philistines into his hand. That's the same behavior we see in David. Plus, they all both want to honor God. We don't see that in Saul. So I have this growing sense that maybe Jonathan understands David is the next king. It's going to happen. And so by taking off his garments, he's anointing them. There's also this motif, and we've seen this is the third time now David receives someone's weapons. Remember when he was going to go fight Goliath and Solomon says, here, put on my armor. Here's my sword. Here's my, here's all my gear in it. And David is like, eh, that's it. I'm, I'm good. I got my sling, got my rocks. I'm good. But David, you know, it was given to him. Then David was given the, Saul, the, the sword of Goliath, so to speak. I mean, he kind of took it from him, chopped his head off, but David received the sword. And now he's receiving the weapons from Jonathan. That is, that the, the writer including that in this book is meant to show something, and it's the rise of David. It's the power that God is blessing him, whereas God has rejected Saul. He's not doing that for Saul. Saul had some victories. He's, he's still a powerful warrior. He's still king. He still commands thousands, but he's not being blessed in the same way that David is. Now we got to get to the, the drama, because... We, we, we see in this passage, let me go back to verse 3. Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Did you recognize that phrase, first of all? It, it's a biblical phrase. Okay, now, you, don't jump to the New Testament. Don't jump to love your neighbor as yourself. Because that wasn't first a New Testament passage. Jesus didn't, didn't just grab that out of the air. He grabbed it from his law that he gave to Moses. Right, so let's jump ahead. We'll look to Leviticus 19.18. The law. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, unfortunately, this passage and this relationship between John and Jonathan and David, some people in, our, in this day and age have wanted to imply that there was something else going on, that there was a homosexual relationship between Jonathan and David. Maybe you've heard people say that or imply that. In fact, people do that and they talk about the apostles, talk about Jesus, and they certainly talk about Jonathan and David. Is there anything to that? Well, we have this word that back in verse 3 says Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. First of all, Jonathan made the covenant. Now, a covenant is not a contract. There's a difference. In a contract, two people come together and agree to something. And if either one of them breaks it, the contract is null. A covenant can be one-sided. We see God, remember, I don't remember the story in Genesis where God does that with Abraham. Makes Abraham fall asleep, and then God divides the animals and the, 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 the torch goes through between them. That means God ratified the covenant, and it all depended on him. That's the Abrahamic covenant. It really doesn't matter what Abraham does. God selected Abraham, chosen 
ratified the covenant. Here, Jonathan made a covenant with David, and he ratifies it by giving David his robe, his tunic, his bow, his sword, his belt. So he ratified it, which means Jonathan is saying, I'm committed to you. I am on your team. I will defend you. I support you. I'll never fight against you. And then we have this phrase, he loved him as himself. And, and we have people in this day and age that want to say that's a homosexual relationship. First of all, let me tell you why they do that. They do that because people like to project themselves into other situations and they see their own sin in everybody. Liars don't trust anybody. You know why? They think everybody is lying. Why? You know why? Because they lie, right? They assume everybody else is. Cheaters assume everybody is cheating. Right? Is cheating. Homosexuals see in any relationship between two same-sex people, and they assume that it must be what they do. There is nothing in this text. In fact, I can prove it a lot of different ways, but we'll just look at the words. Okay, we have we have um, a, a couple of words here. When we start looking in the in the Hebrew. Uh, the word love, uh, ahab, translated love, nowhere in the biblical text is this word used to describe a relationship or a love between homosexuals. Ever, not ever used. You say, well, is homosexual love talked about in Scripture? Yes, it is. And, it, and, and it's used in the Hebrew, but it's always this word, yada, always which is a simple basic word to know in the biblical sense. We say that that's the word that is used to describe them. It's basically describing a sex act. It's not describing the commitment love that was talked about in the other word that is used to describe Jonathan and David, period. So if anybody tries to tell you, oh yeah, Jonathan and David were, were homosexual. Okay. They're, they're telling you who they are. They're telling you their worldview. Please don't get pulled into it. But there was something definitely special between uh, Jonathan and David. And we, you know, when we start seeing this, we, we have to recognize that this is how God works. Everybody in Solomon's circle is going to support David. I mean, uh, not just Jonathan, but Saul. I mean, excuse me, not Solomon, but Saul, Jonathan, uh, Saul's son, Jonathan, and then Saul's daughter, uh, Mikhail, is going to love David. This is how God works. But the thing that we see in Jonathan that is unique is Jonathan is humble. He could make a power grab. Even as he sees his father's rising unpopularity, Jonathan could say, I, I want to be king, or I deserve it, or I should be the king maker. But he doesn't. He recognizes in David that God has anointed him, God has chosen him, and he pledges even before David is even close to rising to the throne, Jonathan pledges his support to him, makes a covenant, one-sided covenant. I will support you. I have your back. And so that's more than friendship. A lot of people look at them and they say, Jonathan and David, that's a, that's a picture of friendship. It's there, there was love there. There was a brotherly love, but it's so much more than friendship. There's a 30-year age gap between these two men. Okay, Jonathan is much older than David. But they're of one heart and of one mind. And so when you look at this, don't see something unseemly. See something absolutely beautiful and the selfless uh, submission on Jonathan's part to David is absolutely wonderful, especially in this day and age when all politics is filled with power grabs. This is the opposite. This is absolute humility and recognizing God has a plan and God has chosen, and let's follow that. So Jonathan is truly one of the heroes of this story. But it doesn't just exist in a vacuum because with David, there's this rising popularity. We want to look at that in verses 6 through 9. Verse 6, when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine... Probably talking about Goliath, but it could be a general reference to he was always killing Philistines. It was just what he did. The women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing with joyful songs with timbrels and lyres. As they danced, they sang. 
Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. By the way, this week, uh, we've got a music minister here with us, and he's been breaking out the song everywhere we go. It's a little obnoxious, but it's okay. He's a good singer. All right. David, I'm going to ask you, have you ever sung Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands? That's a great song. Yeah, it's... It's got a great tune, but can you dance to it? You know, I can't dance anyway. But now, the reaction to this song. Now, we look at this song and they say, "Yeah, that's kind of provocative," but that's because we don't speak Hebrew. So I'll come back to that. But this is the reaction. Saul was angry, very angry. This refrain refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands. He thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get? But the kingdom. <laughs> Paranoia much? Right? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. Now, we're not to the key verse, but this is a very, very, very important passage for us to ex- understand the rest of First Samuel. I'm serious. So let's, let's back, back up just a minute. We look at Hebrew. Hebrew uh, poetry is uh, very, frequ- very frequently uses the couplet. The couplet is when you say two things that are basically the same thing, but you say it in different ways. It's, it's poetry. Uh, it, it's, it's a beautiful night tonight. The stars are shining. Okay, I'm kind of saying the same thing, but I say it in a different way to give it a poetic feel. I don't believe the women had a motive here to really stick it to Saul. That would not be smart. Okay. That wouldn't get you in the Billboard Top 40, for sure, with your song. They're using Hebrew poetry, and they're celebrating the victory of both men. David is first, and David is second, which gives Saul the primacy of, of mention, but David is given more, and so it's kind of an even out thing, but Saul doesn't take it that way. But let's not put this on the ladies. I think it was it's good songwriting. I, maybe in heaven we'll hear the tune. Um, but so his reaction is very, very important. Okay, so I want you to remember this passage because a little later on we're going to see that this evil spirit from God comes on Saul and then he becomes murderous. But I'm going to tell you where that begins. It begins right here. You know, you, everybody, everybody knows what this feeling is here. This is jealousy or envy, right? And it leads to this anger and hatred, which ultimately leads to attempted murder. Now, people often forget this setup because they get focused on an evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul. Let me tell you something. Old Testament or New Testament, one thing is for sure. When you're walking with the Lord, when the Spirit of God is in you, is on you, There is no evil spirit that can touch you. But when you're filled with jealousy and anger, you're wide open to any kind of influence that will be negative. So when we talk about the evil spirit from the Lord, let me tell you, that is a a natural consequence to not dealing with sin. So this is one of those times where we say, okay, is there a takeaway here? Yes, we have to deal with our own sin. You get jealous and envious, angry, have lust, have greed, whatever, laziness. When those things come upon you, you've got, we have to deal with you. We have to deal with those immediately because little sins become big sins, and big sins will kill you. Right? Little sins become big sins. Nobody cared that, you know, he's just over there stewing. He's kind of muttering to himself, 2,000, you know, just nobody cares. But no, the king is in a downward spiral because that jealousy is taking hold. You know, our news blows up all the time with murders and mayhem. It, this is the kind of stuff that begins. You don't just go out and murder somebody on the street. It starts out with a dark heart not being dealt with. So he's angry. So let's talk about Saul's jealousy. Now, Saul's jealousy, we're going to see uh, manifest in two different ways, a direct attack and an indirect attack. The direct attack is first, verses 10 and 11. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul, right? 
the next day. How is that? Because his heart was darkened and he wasn't dealing with his mess. Period. That's why the next day here is a relevant phrase. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcefully on Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the lyre as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand. This is the most incongruous verse in the Bible, I think. Okay. Right. Evil spirit from God. I've got sin I've not deal, dealt with. I'm prophesying and I've got a spear in my hand. Okay. If you ever show up at somebody's house and any of that, any combination of that is going on, you ever see me at home walking back, muttering to myself, <laughs> calling down heavenly fire? I got a spear in my hand. That's a bad sign. But this, it seems comical, but it's, it's a manifestation of what was happening in his heart. So he has a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. I don't know what to make about David in this verse. Usually somebody throws a spear at me, they get one shot, then I'm out. <laughs> you know, <laughs> threw it at him twice. You know, what does David just, you know? Okay, maybe he didn't mean to do that. It gives him another shot. So this evil spirit from God, we saw this back in chapter 16, I think. 14, 16, anyway. We saw this previously. Uh, chapter 16. We saw this back in chapter 16, um, and the scripture doesn't say what this was. We, we Back then, for those of you that weren't here, it's, there's a few possibilities. Was this an angel from the Lord? Because remember, this evil spirit is a part of God's judgment on Saul because Saul was disobedient. So God rejects Saul as king, and then this is a consequence of his judgment. So was it an angel? Was it a fallen angel or a demon? Or is this just some natural manifestation in in Saul, some emotional depression, funk that he is in, uh, we don't know. The scripture doesn't tell us. I tend to think it's like a demonic, in a sense, that God is allowing on Saul because this is a judgment from God. It's very clearly a judgment from God. God is allowing this to happen. So the result is this ecstatic behavior. He's got a spear in his hand. He's prophesying. That is is speaking of spiritual truths. Now, it doesn't say it's from the Lord. It doesn't say it's not. But he is this, and very clearly, in an ecstatic state. Uh, and it's negative. So prophesying on Saul's part, we see three times in this book. The first time was kind of positive because the Spirit of God came upon him, and he spoke truth with the other prophets. Then there's this time, and then it's going to happen again in chapter 19, and it's most definitely negative in that chapter. So I think this is a very negative thing, and it's, it is part of God's judgment, where Saul has been invited in, in, by God to, in, to be in this wonderful position and to serve the Lord as the king of Israel, but he can't get past his own sin. And so here he is. And so we have, and now why is David there? Remember, back in the, chapter 16, when he had a dark spirit, the uh, other servant would go get David, and David would come in and play his harp. So David's got a harp in his hand. Saul has a spear in his hand. Okay, it tells you something about these men. So there's this very ne great negativity. Verse, oh, there he is. I penciled that this afternoon for you guys. <laughs> Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but had departed from Saul. There it is. There is the key verse. This verse explains the entire rest of this book. You know, this book ends and Saul is dead. And this is where, this is the crux of it all. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David, but had departed from Saul. It doesn't matter how powerful you are. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how talented you are. If the Lord is not with you, you've got a big problem. And the Lord wasn't with Saul because of Saul. Because Saul was disobedient. And, so, and the Lord rejected him. Now, why was Saul there in the first place? Remember, it was a popularity contest. The people wanted somebody. So who did they want? They wanted the tall, good-looking guy, and they got him. And so a guy that was chosen because of a popularity contest, now suddenly a song is sung 
in which he appears and feels less popular than this kid. And it hits his heart kind of hard. Bless his heart. See, if you build your life around who you think you are, you're always going to be disappointed. You're always going to be upset. Meanwhile, David knows who he is. He, well, he doesn't even seem to care. He's not focused on himself. He's there to honor the Lord and serve God and serve the king because he's not focused on himself. But the Lord was with David and it departed from Saul. So he sent David away from him and gave him command over a thousand men. And David led the troops in their campaign. By the way, anytime a translator in this chapter and most of the book, there is a, a textual issue uh, here with this word elaf, and, and it can or elef, uh, it can mean a thousand, but it can also mean a military unit. The word is used both ways, and usually there's no way other than the context, and sometimes the context doesn't really make it clear. So is David given a thousand men, or is he given a military unit? Now, a military unit's a large unit, but there's no way to know, but just mentioning that. So a thousand is as good a way to look at it as anything. So, so, he sent, so Saul sends David away and gives him command over a thousand men, and David led the troops in their campaign. And everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. But all Israel, excuse me, but all Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaigns. So, you know, sending him away was a, you know, I think Saul probably had two reasons. One, anytime he looked at the kid, he was annoyed. The song is going through his head, you know, it's just like a jingle from a stupid commercial. Ten thousand, you know, he's just sitting there getting mad about it every time he sees David. Second of all, if he sends him out with military men, what do military men do? They go fight, go fight Philistines. Every time David is out there, there's a chance he's going to be killed. Good for Saul, right? So Saul is not selfless in this. He's really looking for David to get killed. Uh, and we're, we're going to prove that here in just a minute because the text makes it pretty clear. So verse 16 says, but all Israel and Judah love David. This is kind of a problem verse because this is the United Kingdom. It's Israel. Why does the writer say Israel and Judah? See, we have Saul, David, Solomon, United Kingdom. And then after that, the kingdom is divided. We have, we have this. We have Israel to the north and Judah to the south. Well, there's Israel and there's Judah. And so the kingdom is divided. Two possibilities. One possibility is this was written after the, uh, the division of the kingdom. And so that was a way to refer to it. But I think more likely, I think it was written more contemporaneously with the story, maybe shortly after it happened. And so I think people had already started kind of using these references. It's like talking about the North and the South in the U.S. You know, we're not divided, but there is the North and the South. You know, the Mason-Dixon line, right? It's, it's the North and the South. And you say that, it doesn't mean it's divided, but it's a clear reference. I think that's kind of probably what was already happening because it was a cultural difference. So David is uh, out of the palace. Saul is hoping that he's going to die. Now there's the indirect attacks. We see in verse 17, Saul said to David, here's my older daughter, Mirah. I will give her to you in marriage. Only serve me bravely and fight the battles of the Lord. For Saul said to himself, I will not raise a hand against her. Let the Philistines do that. So Remember, he had already, Saul had already promised his daughter to the man that killed Goliath. And he still had, he's reneged on his promise. Now he's saying, okay, you can have my daughter, uh, but you got to keep going out and fighting. And he's, he's even going to up the, the ante. And his goal is that David will be killed by the Philistines. So he wants them going out there. But David said to Saul, who am I? And what is my family or my clan in Israel? that I should become the king's son-in-law. In other words, I'm nobody. I don't have any money. I can't pay a dowry. I don't, I don't have anything. Who am I? So when the time came for Marab, Saul's daughter, to be given to David, she was given in marriage to Adriel of Mahola. Now, Saul's daughter, Michal, was in love with David, and when they told Saul about it, he was pleased. Now, this is one of those ambiguous times love is used. Because we don't know if, did she love David like Jonathan loved David? Or did she love David more passionately? There's no way to know. 
But it's kind of interesting that though Saul was starting to hate David, two of his kids loved him. He's a lovable guy. Now, verse 21, I will give her to him, he thought, so that she may be a snare to him, so that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. So Saul said to David, now you have a second opportunity to become my son-in-law. How would Michal be a snare to David? Uh, Because she loved him. She's not looking to hurt him. But I think what Saul was thinking here was if David is now the son-in-law to the king, the Philistines are going to be more focused on attacking him personally when they're in battle. If you want to take somebody out, you want to take out the king's son. So I think he was trying to use the position of bringing David into the family to make him a bigger target. I don't think he was looking to manipulate his daughter uh, in order to somehow sabotage his son. I think it was just the uh, association that he was looking for. Verse 22, then Saul ordered his attendant to speak to David privately and say, look, the king likes you and his attendants all love you. Now become his son-in-law. They repeated these words to David, but David said, do you think it is a small matter to become the king's son-in-law? I'm only a poor man and little known. When Saul's servants told him what David had said, Saul replied, say to David, the king wants no other price for the bride than a hundred Philistine foreskins. That means what you think it means to take revenge on his enemies. Saul's plan was to have David fall by the hands of the Philistines. When the attendants told David these things, he was pleased to become the king's son-in-law. So before the time allotted, before the allotted time elapsed, David took his men with him, went out and killed 200 Philistines. If 100's good, 200's better, and brought back their foreskins. They counted out the full number to the king so that David might become the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave him his daughter, Michal, in marriage. By the way, the mutilation of a dead body is not unique to Israel. Uh, this would be no different than scalping in the Wild West in the United States. Um, other societies and cultures have done this. They're dead, and this is what soldiers do as a mark of bravery and of reporting back true casualties. So whether you're cutting off digits or appendages or gouging out things or whatever, it was a way to report back in a more brutal time before everybody had cameras on their bodies. So times have changed. When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Michal loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him and remained his enemy the rest of his days. The Philistine commanders continued to go out into battle, as, at, and as often as they did, David met with more success than the rest of Saul's officers, and his name became well known. This uh, story is uh, such a a uh, painful reality of what's happening in the kingdom because you know we have the benefit of knowing the end of the story that Saul is on the decline and we have the benefit of knowing that truly in this David is innocent now David is not going to remain innocent David is going to make some mistakes along the way um, he's going to violate his own conscience he's going to violate the law people sin but what we're going to see is the overall attitude of wanting to reconcile with God, recognizing that it is God we have to reconcile, rather than to worry about our own po- his own popularity, uh, how people view him, uh, how successful he is in the eyes of man. So it's a big, big difference. And again, that's that's the contrast that we're to be looking for in this book. So God protected David. He gave him victory continually in battles, uh, even when he's going out to kill these Philistines and mutilate their corpses, he has tremendous victory. He is a powerful, powerful soldier. Uh, And again, it goes back to that key verse. The Lord was with him. The contrast is so important because when the Lord is with you, whatever evil spirit, whatever torment that the world can offer is powerless. That's a huge takeaway. That's something so relevant for us as believers in this day and age. We recognize that we've got to be trusting in God, and we've got to stay with a clear conscience. We've got to continually confess and repent of sin. Otherwise, we open ourselves up, not for a loss of salvation, but certainly certainly for, for a loss of peace, certainly to give in to the temptations and the torment the world 
offers. So that's why it's such a, uh, an important uh, contrast and an important illustration for us to recognize. Make sense? All right. So let's try to keep our conscience clear, walk with the Spirit. The story is going to get even spicier in the next few weeks. <laughs> let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for your love. Thank you for your provision and your blessing. Uh, Lord, as uh, believers, we uh, are so thankful to be indwelt permanently by the Holy Spirit of God. Oh, Lord, we know our sin can grieve the Holy Spirit, remove us from that place of blessing that you want us to live in and to walk in. And Lord, often by our own hand, we bring upon the, the worst kind of torment in our lives. Lord, help us to be aware. Help us to recognize it when it's happening. Help us to see when that bad day is just beating us down and we feel lost and we feel like that you have given up on us, that it's really us that have given up on you. And to take that really short trip back by confessing sin and trusting with our whole heart that you are the one we should follow. You are the one that we should trust. You are the one that we should obey. And Lord, in doing that, that we can experience all that you have for us in this life. We love you, praise you, in Jesus' name.